Okay guys, so today's the big day. I am about to go in for my clinical simulation exams. I'm just kind of sitting in my car here, uh, trying to relax a little before I go in. And yeah, I don't really know what else to tell you guys other than I'm getting ready to go in. Okay, wish me luck. Oh my god, you guys. So, I am officially a registered respiratory therapist. That test was so stressful, I thought I was going to cry when I came out and was waiting for the results. <laughs> oh my god, you guys, I can't believe I can't believe I passed. Ah. Oh my gosh, you guys. Ah. I feel so much better. Okay, alright, so I'm gonna go home and we'll talk about it later, I guess. <laughs> Hey guys, so I am officially a registered respiratory therapist. It's been a long, long journey. And I know that the final exam, the clinical simulation exam, is something that a lot of people stress out about, especially, you know, I did also. So I just wanted to talk to you guys about a couple of the things that I did to try to prepare for the clinical simulation exam, as well as a couple of the things that I learned after taking the exam, because I think the biggest problem that people have with this exam is anxiety of the unknown and of course the anxiety of spending two plus years in a course and working towards getting your degree and then it all kind of coming down to these two exams. So of course a lot of things kind of remain unknown if you will until you take the actual exam because you can hear so much about it but then you're still sitting there wondering what if what if it's like this what if it's like that what if this or that happens so hopefully i can clear up some of these things for you so first things first a little bit about the clinical simulation exam or the csc you have four hours to complete the exam and it's made up of 22 clinical simulations. Now, some of these simulations may have one to two questions, some of them may have five or six questions inside each one. Each simulation is different. Now, with the 22 simulations, similar to the TMC, only 20 of them count towards your score. There are two practice simulations that they use for, you know, deciding whether they're going to use them as graded simulations in the future or for practice exams or whatever they use them for. But again, you don't know which of these simulations are practice and which are scored. It could be your first simulation, it could be in the middle, it could be the end, you have no idea. So to qualify to take your clinical simulation exam, as of 2018, you need to score 94 or higher on your therapist multiple choice exam. To pass your clinical simulation exam and earn your RRT credentials, you need approximately 73% or higher. Now each exam, I'm sure you've all seen photos that people post of their scores when they uh, when they pass. Some of them, you know, they, they can get up to 400 points for total points. Some of them are, you know, 300 and something. So this one is not point based like the TMC is. This one is off of a percentage and it's approximately 73% that you need to pass. Now again, for the TMC uh, information, you know, uh, minimum scores needed and some tips for the TMC, I'll link that in the description down below if you guys haven't watched that already. One of the questions I'm getting asked a lot is what materials did I use to study? So we'll look at that really quick and then we'll go into some of my tips for the exam. One of the most important things is doing as many practice simulations as you can and looking at the rationale and seeing kind of you know, what the exam is looking for. You can actually go to nbrc.org. They provide two free practice clinical simulations that you can take, but they do also offer um, a not full, they offer a more complete set of simulations you can take that are very, very close to how the actual test format is laid out and the difficulty of the exam. They have two versions, but they're $70 each, so I can get a little bit pricey. Um, I did not do both of those, so but that is an option for you. You can go to, again, ndrc.org the uh, credentialing agency that puts out those exams. So if you really wanna know what those are going to be like and you have the extra funds, you can purchase those practice exams or practice simulations and take them from there and they give you full rationales as well. 
for each uh, section of what you chose correct and incorrect. I know I've been talking to you guys about this a lot. I also use the online portion of Persing's Respiratory Care Review and they have uh, quite a few practice simulations as well. So again, it really comes down to doing those practice simulations. As well as the workshop for Persings, that made a huge difference because he went through some of those simulations and broke down the rationale even further for each section than what the online portion does. There's a couple of things with the AARC exam prep course that you can use. I did also use that long term to go over the various um, sections, you know, like equipment and troubleshooting, diagnostics, decision making, all of that. So they do offer videos as well as PowerPoints, but right at the very end, there's actually a section that's broken down into how to prepare for the exam, study skills, as well as specific tips for how to take the TMC and the CSE. So those are really valuable things to look into. And again, if you have your student membership with the AARC, that's completely free to you. And just in case you guys do have that, or if that's something you're interested in getting, I will link in the description the, the actual course for the AARC exam prep course for students. Something else I do want to bring up because <laughs> when you're a student, funds can become limited. So if you are also a AARC member, you can actually get $40 off your clinical simulation exam. All you have to do, uh, you know, after you're a member is log into the AARC, go to your member benefits section, and there's a section that will give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to get that $40 discount off the CSC. It does come in two emails. One email is confirming that you requested the discount. Second email will actually be the link that will allow you to get that discount. So just make sure you look out for that second email. It may come along with the first or, you know, it could end up in your spam folder or, or take an ex extra half an hour, hour to arrive, anything like that. So if you don't get it immediately, don't panic. <laughs> just keep checking your email for the link or, you know, contact the ARC and say, hey, I requested this link and I still haven't gotten it and maybe they can get it to you a little sooner. All right, so now into actual exam tips. Again, like I mentioned earlier, the biggest thing with these exams is anxiety and kind of fear of the unknown and you, you ju you're just nervous because again, you know, it's this huge exam and everyone makes such a big deal about it and you're sitting there, oh my God, I need to pass this test. So the most important thing that you can do before the test and during the test is breathe and pause and recollect yourself. You do have four hours to take the exam, so it's not a race. That's more than enough time to get all of the simulations done. So what I ended up doing and you know what was suggested to me by other people and it really made a huge difference. If you start to feel a little frustrated during the exam or maybe you're getting a lot of uh, sections where you click an option that says physician disagrees, you know, you just need to stop, take a deep breath, and kind of recollect yourself. An option that you do have also, if you have time, so again, make sure that you are kind of keeping an eye on your time if you're going to do this, is you can stand up, go get a drink of water, you know, walk around the building a little bit or, you know, and just take a quick break to kind of mentally reset yourself because sometimes when we start to get really anxious or frustrated by something, it's just kind of like a downward spiral and even just that five minute break that you can get can really reset everything for you and let you refocus. All right, so at the testing center I went to, they gave us one sheet of paper. You can go ask for more, of course, but they start out with one and I suggest writing down key detailed pieces of information. So like critical values, if one pops up when you select a diagnostic test or if you are given the height or weight in the initial scenario, immediately do your ideal body weight calculation and the average tidal volume that you may need so that you're kind of prepared if you do need to do any diagnostic tests, like if you need to know if their vital capacity is adequate for them. You've already got your ideal body weight, which can help you, you know, figure out if that's an adequate vital capacity or not. As well as if in that scenario the patient ends up needing to be mechanically ventilated, you've already got your tidal volume 
figure it out there. If you don't use it, it's not a big deal, but it just kind of helps prepare you that way. You know, initially as you're seeing this information, you don't have to scroll back up in the scenario to figure out, oh, how tall were they? How much did they weigh? What was going on with this patient? You've already got it right there on your sheet of paper. Just try to keep it organized. I just put a little box around each one so that it wouldn't run into the next scenario. Something else I would make a note of besides critical values or, you know, ideal body weight and average tidal volume I might need would be important words that stood out. So if it said marked strider, I'd write that down or um, quick assessment because quick assessment versus a complete cardiopulmonary assessment are going to be different. If it says quick assessment, you're not gonna order an ABG initially because that's not quick. You have to go get the, the items, you need to poke the patient, you need to wait for the results to come back. This is all going to be about what you can see, touch, and hear. That's a quick assessment. So uh, vitals, breath sounds, looking for edema, anything of the sort. So again, very quick assessment versus where if it says a full cardiopulmonary assessment, that's when you're going to do your ECG. That's when you might get your x-ray, things that can take a little extra time. So if I saw any key words, I would try to write them down to keep that fresh in my mind. That way when I'm picking the options, I can go back to that and look. And again, you know, you can scroll up to see what the previous information was, but for me it was easier to have that key information right in front of me on my paper. But if you need to, you know, definitely scroll back up to review the scenario if you think you've missed something because that's what it's there for. So going to picking your options, a lot of times they will either kind of rephrase the name of a test or add tests that are unnecessary. If you see the Binsky reflex and you're not sure what that is or if it even applies, probably not going to apply most of the time in a lot of, at least not in any of the scenarios that I really got. But if you're not sure what something is, don't pick it. It's better to not lose points by picking something that's incorrect or to just not gain points at all. So if you're not sure, again, don't pick it. It could just be a distractor in the exam. Because if you pick something that's incorrect, you're going to lose points. If you don't pick something in, you know, a pick all that applies scenario, you just won't gain points. So it is a little bit of a gamble, but if you look at something you're like, I have never heard of that, what is that? Then I want I just want to suggest picking it. <laughs> so something that was hard to get used to for me, especially when I was doing the practice exams, if they would tell you to choose only one option and then it would say physician disagrees. It's very easy to panic and just go, oh my God, and pick something, you know, pick the next one. It's not a race, don't get click happy. <laughs> so if that happens, again, take a breath, reread the question, make sure that you didn't miss, you know, one important word that changes kind of what they're looking for, reread the scenario if you need to, and then reevaluate your options because just sitting there and clicking each time is not going to help you reevaluate the whole situation. Don't let that initial, oh my God, I got something wrong, you know, kind of again, turn into a downward spiral. Don't get click happy and just click the next one. Make sure you reevaluate everything fully. If you're someone in general, if it's a select all that applies question and you just feel like you need to click everything, again, it's better to not click something if you don't know what it is so that you won't lose points. And what I would do is I would read the question itself, read through my options, and then read the question again. This is kind of different for everybody um, because I found during my practice exams, I would try to click the options as I was reading them, which sometimes got me into trouble because you know you don't want to get in the habit of clicking through and accidentally click something you don't mean to and lose points. Or maybe, again, you missed an important word in what it's asking you, whether it says that you need an immediate intervention or something that's more long term. So again, look at your options, see what they are. Are they immediate interventions? Are they a quick assessment? Are they a full assessment option? Is it a long term option? So for example, if you have someone that comes in with chest pain, you're probably not going to do an exercise stress test immediately. Maybe down the road, but not when they walk in. So again, make sure you read those questions carefully 
and really think about what these options are. So if you read that question, read through your options, and then read the question again, you go, mm, no, it's something I need to do right now, not tomorrow. And this is gonna help you, again, rule out incorrect options when it is a pick one only and less directed to pick another. Um, so you're gonna look at your title volume, make sure your title volume's the right you know, amount, which actually, Sometimes in those exams, you may actually have a title volume that's 50 milliliters over the max, but if that's the best option overall versus mode, and if your FiO2 is correct and your PEEP, then you know you may have to go a little bit over the, um, the title volume range that you calculate. It shouldn't be anything absurd like 200 or 300 over, but they may go you know 50 milliliters or so over. So you just really need to evaluate the question. There were a couple of things that I noticed during taking practice exams that I'll point out for you guys just so that hopefully they're helpful. If you have a patient that is on some type of non-invasive device and they need to be intubated, you want to make sure that you keep your FiO2 the same. So for example, if your patient is on, um, you know, a high flow nasal cannula receiving 70% oxygen, something of the sort like that, then if they get intubated, you probably want to start at 70% unless it's some type of uh, situation where they need 100%, such as a heart attack or a burn, anything of the sort. And you want to look, so if your patient, if you have a neonatal patient and they were on CPAP before you intubate them, you want to make sure that when they are intubated that, that CPAP is at least the same amount as they were on before they were intubated because obviously if you go lower that's not going to be beneficial to the patient. So you just need to make sure that these little things match up. You can go a tiny bit above, you know, but um, you want to keep those ranges if possible. So also they like to keep the FiO2 below 70%. So if you need to make some type of change for oxygenation, for example, and your patient is on 70% oxygen already, that's when you want to increase your PEEP. So those are just some of the basic tips of kind of what helped me pass the exam and some information regarding the exam itself. If you guys have tips for what helped you pass the clinical simulation exam, feel free to leave it in the comments down below for anyone watching that is about to take their exam. All right, guys, so again, thanks as always for watching, and I will see you next time.